the underwater world. Without special equipment, we can't survive in its cold and airless embrace. This is an alien world, with creatures all the more frightening for being unfamiliar to us. Anything could be lurking down in the depths. Yet we're strangely drawn to the ocean. We harvest it for food. We cross it. We simply enjoy it. But the dangers of the deep are real. And for one family at least, a nightmare became reality. It started as a pleasure trip. In this reconstruction, Diane Hooper tells their story in her own words. Ed and I had set out with our five children from Carabel, Florida, for the journey to Tampa, St. Petersburg. When we checked with the Weather Bureau, they told us it was going to be clear, calm, just beautiful. I went to check on Gerald because he'd had a fever. Gerald was our oldest son. Then there was Billy, a little Tex. And we had two girls, Diana Jo and Melissa. For the first few hours, it was really very uneventful. But then a strong wind came up, out of nowhere. As the forecast had been good, they were traveling overnight to reach Tampa in daylight. As it got darker, I stayed inside with the light on, talking to the kids about what we were going to do the next day. But then I noticed water on the floor. Ed, there's water down here coming up through the floor. Try the bill pump. Remember what I showed you? When Ed gave us the life jackets, I found it hard to believe that this could be happening to us. Mayday, Mayday, this is the Princess Diane you read over Mayday, Mayday, 35 miles southwest of Caravel, taking on water and heavy sea. Diane, you better bring the kids up on deck. The deck was flooding, and the back of the boat was sinking into the water. Ed had found a piece of rope, which he laced through each of us, and tied us in a circle so we could keep together. Don't pull it tighter. Grab each other's hands. <laughs> we felt very alone. The night seemed to go on forever, but the wind died down, and we kept our spirits up by singing while we waited for the dawn and the hope of rescue. There'd been no choice but to leave the sinking boat, and they had no idea if anyone had heard their mayday call. They could only wait and hope. We were so exhausted, we kept drifting in and out of sleep. <laughs> the plane passed by quite close to us. We were sure it must have spotted us, but it just kept on going. The search plane had seen them, and something else, sharks. The pilot contacted a nearby fishing boat to guide it to the rescue. Rebel Lady, reading you loud and clear. Rebel Lady, we have spotted survivors. When the plane came back for the second time, the family untied the rope and broke their circle to become more visible. Just spread out. Okay. Spread out. Wait. That was a mistake. <laughs> the 
Dillard just knew he couldn't swim. It all happened so quickly. I just grabbed him and held on to him. Mom, you're holding me too tight. Really, I'm trying to keep your life vest on. Here, stay in tight. Give me a hand. Give me a hand. Diane lost two sons that tragic day. Billy from the shark attack and little Tex from the cold. It's taken me 20 years to accept that the sharks weren't just out to kill us. We were just doing their thing. We were doing ours and the two worlds just collided. The sharks may have been circling them for hours, drawn by the splashing, shouting, but the family may have seen too large a target to attack until they spread out. And vibrations from the low-flying plane could have roused the sharks even more. Attacks like this are extremely rare. In the United States, you're a thousand times more likely to drown than be killed by a shark. Most sharks do not normally see us as prey. To them, the oceans are full of much more familiar food. A young albatross that has landed on the surface of the water is what this tiger shark's been waiting for. Sharks are attracted to anything splashing about on the surface, but they may not attack at once, circling warily before moving in. Most of us are terrified of sharks, but of the 350 kinds of shark worldwide, only three or four threaten us with any regularity. On the whole, our fears are misplaced. Shark problems are surprisingly rare, although in 1991 and 92, Hawaii did suffer a spate of tiger shark attacks. Come on, let's go. Let's get out of the Every year, millions of people bathe safely in the sea. Yet surfers came into conflict with the sharks. One of them was attacked only a few meters offshore. David Silver. I was paddling in when all of a sudden I felt a big tug on my leg. I looked back, my left leg was in a shark's mouth. First, I thought I, I was going to die. Silver was lucky. <coughs> On December the 23rd, another surfer was attacked, Gary Chan. I just finished catching a wave and began panning back out. Out of nowhere, this big shark came out and took a chomp out of my board. He was trying to get, get the board away from me, so I, I, my first instinct was to jump off and try and get away from him. But I realized that I had to get my board to paddle back in, so I started wrestling with him to try and get my board back as he kept on biting it. I finally got the board loose, and uh, I consider myself very lucky to be alive right now. With thousands in the water every day in Hawaii, you might think there'd be more attacks, but the average here is only two a year. Could even those be avoided? Kim Holland of the University of Hawaii is trying to find out. It's understandable when there is a shark attack that people should want to do something about it. One side of the debate says we should have a blanket fishing program to fish for sharks, reduce their numbers, and reduce the number of shark attacks. 
The other side of the debate says that it's the shark's domain. They've been there for millions of years. We should just be careful. Both sides of this debate look to the scientists for answers about what to do about shark attacks. Our research program is designed to find out what is the typical behavior pattern of a tiger shark. And to do this, we go out in the evening and we set long lines of baited hooks. And we go back in the morning, and if we've caught a tiger shark, we put a transmitter on it to see what its normal movement patterns are. Early results are surprising. There are far more tiger sharks than anyone realized. But although they swim close in shore, it's clearly not to target people as prey, or there'd be many more victims. By following tagged sharks, Kim Holland hopes to find ways of eliminating the attacks. It's already known that attacks are more likely at night, in murky water, or anywhere with floating debris. If we are careful about when and where we bathe, we can reduce the risks. Yet some people seek out a close encounter. Here, off the coast of Australia, they're trying to attract the shark with the most ferocious reputation of all. I wouldn't dive in these waters by myself. Along the beach with someone. That lady got eaten? Was that was 11 me? years ago. More people get struck by lightning. Maybe so. At least <coughs> lightning's quick. The divers will be protected by an aluminium cage but a perspex window will give the illusion there's nothing between their soft bodies and the legendary jaws. Whatever people tell you about this shark can never prepare you for the moment you meet it face to face. The Great White. Inspiring, these creatures grow over six meters in length and can weigh well over three tons. In the movie Jaws, the oversized great white was made to look terrifying because it relentlessly stalked its human prey. In nature, that never happens. The great white has been attracted by the bait, but the other objects in the water are strange and unexpected. Sharks are sensitive to electric fields. All creatures generate them, but metal objects do as well. It looks terrifying as it closes in. But it's not after the tourists. It's simply trying to discover more about the strange metal objects in the water. Less than 50 great white attacks have ever been authenticated. Even here in Australia, sharks account for less than one death per year. There's another creature in these waters which is far more deadly. Any naked skin is vulnerable. So if you do go into the water, you must protect yourself. This lump of jelly is more lethal than a ton of shark. It's a box jellyfish. They sting an uncounted number of people every year, bringing intense pain, even death. Unfortunately, now few people die as anti-venom is readily available. Such potent venom subdues prey quickly. The moment you touch the deadly tentacles, they fire hundreds of tiny barbed harpoons, each packed with venom. Victims can be treated with vinegar to prevent further stinging, but the terrible scars can last for years.
Many jellyfish sting, causing thousands of people to suffer and claiming about 30 victims a year worldwide. But most are not so unpleasant. These, living in a lagoon on the island of Palau, have become farmers, not hunters. Their stinging tentacles have been made redundant by internal colonies of algae, which generate food and energy from the sun. So they bask in the sun's life-giving rays, following its movements through the day, migrating en masse from shore to sunlit shore. So much of what lives in the sea is unfamiliar. Our preconceived notions about what's dangerous and what's harmless often turn out to be wrong. It may be beautiful, but look, don't touch. We all know that a giant clam can trap a careless foot, but that particular nightmare is unlikely. It closes too slowly to be a real danger. On the other hand, lionfish look harmless, even delicate, but their lacy dorsal fins disguise venomous spines that can inflict a painful sting on a would-be predator. Secure in their defense, they don't even swim away. Scorpion fish rely on camouflage to stay unseen till disturbed. If an unwary hand or foot discovers their spines, their sting can be fatal. This sea urchin also protects itself with poisonous barbs. Bright colors are often a warning. But gaudy markings also invite human curiosity. This pretty blue-ringed octopus is tiny, with a body smaller than a matchbox. Yet it's one of the most dangerous animals in the oceans using its venom to kill prey, or in defense. For us too, its bite can be fatal. When faced with so many beautiful creatures in the sea, the safest rule is to leave them well alone. Though the shallows of the ocean's fringe may have their perils, so too does freshwater, especially in South America. Early explorers' accounts were rife with nightmare stories of deadly creatures. But is there any truth in these travelers' tales? Many of South America's indigenous peoples live by rivers, accepting any dangers hidden in their murky depths. Piranhas, for instance. Although many species are vegetarian, it's said that the red-bellied piranha can strip a victim to the bone in seconds. For Ramon Albujas, who lives on the Orinoco floodplain, piranhas are easy to catch and good to eat. But Ramon also knows their more sinister side. I remember when I was 10 years old, very close to this area. I was out on the savanna with my mother. We came to a stream which we had to cross, but when I was halfway across, about three meters out, a piranha bit me here, just here, 
another here on my side, then another on my leg here. Piranhas attack even when there is no blood in the water. They are attracted by vibrations. Many will tell you they don't attack people, but they do. I know, they attack me. The truth is that piranhas don't usually attack us. There's not one single recorded death. But where waters recede at the end of the rainy season and fish become concentrated in large, hungry groups, they even attack their own kind. Then the locals know it's best to keep out of the water or run the risk of being nibbled, like Ramon. But there are other dangers. In Colombia's Upper Orinoco, reptile expert Bill Lamar was studying Orinoco crocodiles. We had been in the field for about eight weeks and we decided to go hunting to make the table a bit more interesting. Eventually we moved to the edge of a slow-moving stream uh, that fed into a large swamp. I decided to cross the stream in order to hunt the area on the other side. So we carefully waded into the water. a very sudden, very frightening thing for all three of us. It's quite clear to me that we simply unwittingly triggered a feeding response in a large anaconda. She made a mistake. Even at eight meters in length, she wouldn't have been large enough to have swallowed an adult human. Anacondas hunt by lying in ambush in murky water. Any kind of movement can trigger an attack but their natural prey are creatures like these capybara. When we were able to approach the snake, I can just recall being absolutely stunned by the size of the animal. The length was very impressive, but it was the girth that, that I found to be phenomenal. It certainly seemed as big around as maybe the waist of an average adult human. Snakes tend to touch our most primal fears, and I think the combination of a snake and huge size probably excites our basic fears more than just about anything I can think of. So what's the deadliest creature you can meet in the water? There's one that harms more people than any other, and this Filipino fisherman collects them to make his living. Sea snakes. Incredibly, they're the most abundant reptiles on Earth, and their venom's many times more powerful than any land snakes. They kill more people each year than sharks, jellyfish, or any other creature. These snakes are bound for the skinning factory. Luckily for the fishermen, they're fairly docile. But accidents do happen. Fishermen are especially vulnerable in the tidal estuaries of Southeast Asia. 
Sea snakes are very common here, claiming thousands of victims and hundreds of deaths every year. People are usually bitten on the soft skin between fingers or toes. The snake's fangs are at the back of a tiny mouth, so bites are not always dangerous. Sea snakes are merely land snakes that have exploited the sea as a place to feed. They hunt underwater, just like their relatives on shore, using the forked tongue to detect their prey. Most sea snakes eat fish, so their venom has to be strong enough to immobilize the prey quickly. It's unfortunate that a venom designed to kill fish is so virulent to people, but they never bite us by choice, and accidents only seem to happen when we interfere with them. But however many people are killed by snakes, or sharks, or jellyfish. The biggest killer of all is the sea itself. You're far more likely to drown than be done to death by anything that lives in its storm-tossed waves. Next week, snakes and dragons in cold blood.